Walking down these streets, Kenya seems like one of the most peaceful and stable countries in Africa. But after the country's last election in 2007, a deadly undercurrent of tribalism amongst its own people was revealed. In just a matter of weeks, more than 1,000 people were killed in ethnic violence. With elections slated for next year, what's really beginning to worry people is that ethnic lines are already being drawn. Today, I ask a group of Kenyans if they're worried about their country heading to a new round of violence or if they feel they're overcoming their ethnic divisions. I'm Yvonne Dege, welcome to Nairobi and welcome to the cafe. Joining us in the cafe today are Raila Odinga, Kenya's Prime Minister, whose claims that the country's 2007 election were rigged set off weeks of violence largely along tribal lines. Ndungu Githuku, a poet and actor who practices what he calls artivism. His outspoken views on citizen rights have landed him in jail on more than one occasion. At Sango Chisoni, a prominent women's rights activist who played a leading role in drafting Kenya's new constitution. Paul Muite, a lawyer and former member of parliament. His party is a member of the ruling coalition. Njunguri Wambugu is a columnist who writes about Kenyan identity and a member of Kikuyu's for Change, referring to one of Kenya's most influential tribes. And Kiyama Kara, a community activist and researcher with the Kenyan Debt Relief Network. Hello everyone and thank you for joining me in the cafe here in Nairobi. Uh, Prime Minister Raila Odinga, I have to start this conversation with you. We all saw what happened after the last election, the post-election violence in which over a thousand people were killed. Is Kenya healing its ethnic divide now? Well, I would say yes. Um, uh, we have worked very hard to try to reconcile the society. Since uh, the last crisis, which we say the worst that this country has gone through since independence, um, uh, we are basically trying to appeal to the people's sense of nationality. But more importantly, ethnicity is um, the result of uh, discrimination and exclusion from resources. I always say that it is the disease of the elite who, in competition for scarce resources, resort to their ethnic cocoons to divide the people. It is not a disease of the nation as such. Njuguri, ethnic cocoons that the, the PM is talking about, your organization, Kikuyu's for Kenya, I mean, isn't that, even as a title, creating the kind of tribalism and sectionalism we're trying to beat? Um, the whole purpose of that particular organization was to provoke a conversation about tribalism because uh, we felt very strongly that Kenya was refusing to have a conversation about tribalism. And by calling that name, by giving that name to an organization, an initiative, would actually provoke Kenyans from other communities to find out what it is that makes them feel uncomfortable about their tribes, whether they're Kikuyu or whether they're from other communities. And it's worked very well because it's managed to mainstream a conversation about tribalism in a way Kenya has never had one before. So yes, it does. it is controversial, but it does provoke the kind of conversation we wanted to get. But does everyone buy what, what the PM is saying, yes or no? Broadly speaking, yes. But I think if one was to take a much deeper analytical situation historically, what happened after the elections in uh, 07 was foreseeable, has been coming since 1963. Why do I say so? Because the vision that the nationalists who fought for independence had was betrayed in 1963. This issue of ethnicity came in as a result of politics of patronage. 
the betrayal of that vision. That has continued issues that have not been addressed. Because when you analyze it, the problems of somebody from Ukamban, they are the same problems with somebody from Western province. Good schools for their children and so on and so forth. So what happened was foreseeable. We are at crossroads today. Yes, through the Kofi Annan efforts and the group of eminent persons, and of course the contribution by Honorable, the Right Honorable Prime Minister, the President, we appear to have gotten over that very bad period. But we are not out of the woods yet. So the PM's painting an overly positive picture of the situation? Well, the situation he has to. Yeah. <laughs> I also think, you know, yeah, he's right to some extent that uh, it is true there's some conversation going on amongst ourselves. And uh, picking up from uh, maybe 2007, some of the healing processes that are going on are not necessarily official. Uh, and these are areas where, you know, there the, the needs a lot of encouragement, you know, for these kind of initiatives to go on. But I go, just like uh, Paul is saying, that uh, our problems did not begin in 2007. That was just a climax. We have been having all these problems uh, since before independence. And after independence 63, things continue being the same. So when we come to tribalism, uh, as a poet, I express and say that, uh, uh, that, 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 that what we have is a, is a tribe of two people, the rich and the poor. So if we don't look at the issues of the two classes and see how to bridge the gap, then that's where the problem will be and continue to be. Because when you look at the issue of uh, Mombasa, for example, the coastal area, is a land issue. Basically, it's a land issue. The indigenous people there don't have title deeds. But the people who are in the political class have grabbed land there, have got title deeds. So it's not a lack of paper to print title deeds. It's a lack of uh, will. It's a, it's a lack of uh, wanting to solve these problems. So I think we have to start going back to where the problem started coming up to now. Yeah. Okay, so then you're talking about looking at historic injustices. But surely, guys, we can't keep going back. Can we? Yeah, I mean, I how far we, do we, we go we back? We need to go when, back. What, so, so what do we do? I mean, give me the, the solution. How do we go back and address all think, the injustices? I don't think what Yutuku is saying is, is go back in the sense of, of denial. But I think part of Kenya's problem is that we've never acknowledged the things that happened in the first place. And I agree completely, I, I agree completely with Paul, with, um, with, Kituku, with Kituku and the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Um, this is not something that suddenly erupted in 2007. Kenya has actually always been something that's known as a low-intensity conflict situation. We've known this. In 1992, we had clashes. The particular age-old um, tensions that have been stoked. So we have a leadership that did not put in place Historically, our leadership did not put in place mechanisms that would cultivate nationhood. Instead, they encouraged those divisions because it served the, pa the patronage systems that Paul is talking about, the corruption systems. Those systems are dependent on certain types of networks. Those networks are not formal networks. So they needed that. And they learned very well from the British. The line, the divide that was used by the British was the racial divide. In our leadership as case, it has been the ethnic divide that's used in, that's used in that kind of a way. As Angela's pointing out leadership, Prime Minister, that has to mean you. And there are many people across country, this country who do hold yourself responsible for some of the post-election chaos that we saw and the ethnic divide that we see today and, as we'll talk about later, the upcoming elections next year. How do you respond? Well, everyone, look, first, what Paul is talking about, the, the mirror, is very important because the past must inform the future. At independence, the ethnic divide was not still there. People were very united in fighting against colonialism. There was no tribalism. There's no tribalism at all. You see, Jeremogi would stand and say that Kenyatta was the second god to the Africa. Is that really true that there was no tribalism at independence? Was no tribalism. In fact, the common myth is that Mau Mau was about the Kikuyu community. It wasn't. The struggle for justice started with nationalists that you find across the entire breadth, with Mekatelilis, with, with uh, Samuei, Kuitaleo. And then they metamorphosized into a Mau Mau struggle. 
and there were many, many different. Uh, so that be, that is the vision, that is the dream that was betrayed, and uh, the Prime Minister, irrespective of his views, it's a vision that was again betrayed in zero two, yes. <laughs> when we all came together. Yes, yes, and, yes. And, 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 so we, we've got to get rid of that. Exactly. We've got to move forward. Yes. So, so, but, but then, Yvonne, you've got to understand that the development in Kenya are not unique. Uh, we don't live in isolation. It took place also in several other African countries. This first centralization of power into one institution, the presidency, this is what actually created the patronage system. Because the institution of the presidency became too powerful it emasculated all other institutions of governance. We created this African strongman, the father of the nation, to see the president. See, uh, then now the patronage system created by the elite from the president's community started around that time. So there was politics of exclusion, which actually enhanced ethnicity. If you take the contrast, Tanzania, next door, uh, they came up with a leadership that was um, embracing unity of the people, forward-looking, created higher values to which the people could aspire. They united the people. So ethnicity is not an issue in Tanzania, but it is an issue in this country. Yeah, and, 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 and talking about Kenya, do you know you wanted to come in there as, on what the PM was saying? You see, the issue of ethnicity, as far as I'm concerned, we, we, part of the work we did was going around the country and talking to members of different communities. We talked to like 100 people average from 12 different communities. One of the things that stood out is we all understand what we are. I know what Bin Kikuyu is. Aluo knows what Bin Luo is. But we don't have any idea what Bin Kenyan is. We don't have, and I think that's going to be the challenge moving forward. Somebody has to establish a brand of what being a Kenyan is, because you see, in 1963, the process had begun. Somewhere along the way, it got hijacked and it was divided into a different direction. Now we need to finish that process. We need to come up with an identity that is more powerful than any tribal or religious identity that we have within the country. So that, yes, I'm Kikuyu, but, be, but primarily, I'm Kenyan. And, and that particular aspect is what lacks. We do not know how to define what being Kenyan is. We can talk about anything else. We can talk about being a Christian or being a Muslim. I can talk about being a woman or being a man. I can't explain to you what being Kenyan is. And that, that, in my opinion, is where our leadership is failing. Nobody is raising a flag for us and saying, you know what, this is what being Kenyan is. That, in my opinion, is where we're coming from. Yes. I think we must assume responsibility as a people. Yeah. I think when we keep saying that's where our leaders are failing, I mean, what about we? What are we doing? You, you know, to bring that, to bring that about. I take a different position towards this, this whole discussion. Um, but we have been, the crisis in Kenya today, and as has been building, say, for the past 10 years, uh, it has a lot to do with a couple of things. One is, Kenya is a classic example of a dream deferred. I mean, we got all the right ideas, but took all the wrong turns at the most opportune moments. And I think, most importantly, which you must address at the nation is that our crisis is not only internal. First, I think we have the hang ups of the failures of a post colonial state, and that's what Kenya is starting to grapple with. Then, on top of that, we have had a classic example of elite transition at every turn when we are supposed to move. So, I agree, it's compelling enough that we were nationalistic in 63 when we were getting independence, but actually, the manner in which we got that independence was actually the best foundation of the whole framework of how we have continued to do all these elite transitions. All the negotiations thereof were working on the basis that the masses of the Kenyan people would support the nationalist project on the basis of that it was very clear it was anti-colonial, it was anti-British and this manner of it. But once we had this independence, the sort of framework that we took didn't take on the nationalist persuasion which had brought it to happen. And so we started making all the wrong messages. And then from 63 going forward, including our economic planning, including how we divide and share resources and everything else, has just been a process that discriminates, that dispossesses, and then that, that gives advantage to some of our others. Just give us some examples of ways in which you personally have been impacted 
by tribalism because you hear it all the time, oh, Kenyans are so tribalistic, tribalism. I mean, give me some real examples in your own lives where you have felt this tribalism. I mean, what does it actually feel like? What does tribalism feel like? Tribalism, what does tribalism feel like? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to know. Let me use an example. A couple of months ago, um, you know, the usual political uh, rhetoric that gets done by politicians. and. A member of the political establishment for my community made a comment that I felt was unacceptable uh, vis a vis the Prime Minister. And then I raised it, and I actually did an article. I write uh, a weekly column in one of, the st one of the papers. And it rained on me, literally, from our community. I had people calling me from everywhere. Kikuyu, my fellow Kikuyu, telling me, what is wrong with you? Why are you making a big fuss over something that doesn't exist? The fact that uh, that particular uh, leader made a mistake it's something you should let pass. And, you know, and, let and pass because he's from your tribe? Because he's from my tribe. And, and I'm sure even Paul here is a, is, would give very many examples. Because you're expected to take a certain position, despite whether it makes sense or not, because you come from the community of the person who made it. Okay. And ideally, if you, if you take a different position, then you're assumed to be a traitor to that particular community. And that is what happens from within the communities. And, and it pushes a lot of good people who are not bold enough to actually just keep quiet because you'd rather not start a fight and you're starting a fight with your friends. This is your colleagues, the people you've grown up with, the ones who are telling you, look, I thought you were one of us. Why are you talking like you belong to that side? And for me, that's what tribalism has become. It, it's limited the options that we have. You cannot support a position that belongs, that has been exposed by somebody from another community, even if you believe in it. Because you're scared, you're going to lose business. You're going to lose. Uh, you're going to have a problem in your social in your social networks, and that is tribalism in its present sense right now, as far as I'm concerned. Um, yeah, I don't have many examples to give, but uh, one, and that is to do with the International Criminal Court (ICC), where, as an activist with other activists, we were saying that uh, that is the right way to go, and uh, here you now get uh, a backlash from your own community, not your own community, but individuals in your community who are saying, what are you doing? Why are you going that way? Uh, why, 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 why don't you, you know, see that this is one of our own? But for me, it's about impunity. Impunity doesn't have tribe. Impunity doesn't have color. So when it comes to impunity, it's impunity. And what should be done is that the law should follow its course. So these are some of the things that are, have been happening. In 2007, I, I also remember many colleagues, comrades, activists who went underground just because they came out to speak against it. And now here you're being told that you're letting down your people. So I think um, when it comes to what Paul was saying to Mujiri that uh, we, we also have a responsibility, I agree, as a people, we do have a responsibility. But the leadership also uh, propagates a lot of this because uh, when we get close to the elections, say 2012, Already we can see tribal coalitions happening. being led, happening by, by politicians. Yeah, you know, like, like the Prime Minister? Well, I don't know which uh, coalition he's looking for, but I know so many of his colleagues who are you know, looking for tribal yeah. uh, coalitions, alliances. Whereas I think now we're in a new dispensation, which uh, uh, Atsango and others you know, helped uh, to tie together, which is a, a, a people's will to bring a constitution that is a national constitution for the people. So I think I, I'll, I'll ask uh, my senior comrade here yeah. <laughs> to talk to his yeah. colleagues. Mm -hmm. Let's stop these uh, tribal alliances. Yeah, how, how do you respond to that, PM? Because what Kipipi is saying is that tribal politics, yes, as you politics call it, it is. is beginning. And, and you're part of it, and your colleagues are part of it. Well, um, I'm not a part of it, but I'm in the game. <laughs> you're uh, in the game. Uh, as you, you can see, the alliances are forming. Some of them are called KKK. But, but that they unite so that uh, we can tame so and so, we can defeat so and so. Uh, th this is people who still live in the past. These are the people who live in the past. But Kenya has actually moved on. And uh, now we have a new constitution. We have a new constitutional dispensation. A number of people have actually not realized the potentials that exist as a result of this new constitution. Because here we have an opportunity to realize the Kenyan dream. But, but Pim, I'd like to ask, has Kenya really moved on? I mean, we will go into discussing the new constitution, but has it really moved on? Because we're already seeing it has. I think 
we have a different theoretical framework. Because even when you're talking about um, experiences of tribe, I just want to talk of, of, of ethnic chauvinism because I prefer the phrase ethnic chauvinism. I really don't care for the phrase tribalism. I consider it to be racist if you study its etymology. Um, a tribe is a group of monkeys, frankly. So it's, you know, it's problematic for me. Um, I, as a child, had the joy of having another child walk up to me and say, don't you wish you belonged to the president's tribe? At that point in time, I didn't know that there was a difference between me and other African children. I knew there was a difference between me and other non-African children, but I didn't know there was a difference between me and other African children. Went home, asked my parents what that meant, and my grandfather was home, and he explained it to me. As a child, my experience of that was that somehow somebody thought that because they spoke a different language, and I couldn't quite get it, because other than the fact that they spoke a different language, I didn't understand what was supposed to be the difference between me and these other children, and what was supposed to be so great about belonging to the president's one that they somehow thought that I was supposed to be a lesser person. So it's that, it's that early experience of exclusion. And so I just knew that somehow I was supposed to be different. And what does it do to our children? I watch TV shows that say that people that speak my mother tongue, and I've heard somebody who's in leadership say it. We're only good enough to be cooks and watch people. Okay? Security men. As if, as if that in and it of itself has no honor, by the way. Because also, how dare you insinuate that cooking food is not honorable, or that guarding people's homes is not honorable. But how dare you say to me and my children and our descendants that that is all we are fit to be? And we're supposed to laugh at this. So I would say where we have began to move forward is that we have began to put in place a structural framework that says that if you say things like that about other people, and you're in a position of leadership, there will be consequences. Until August 27th last year, we didn't have consequences for people who behaved like that. If somebody, if the honorable prime, if the right honorable prime minister today, or if Paul, both of whom are people in politics, was to get, were to get up today and say things like that about other people, they need to think about seriously whether or not they will ever be eligible to run for office. You think so they're costs to jail now. If you say something like, like that, or the I actually go think, to jail? I think people should go to jail for that. It, the damage it does to people, the damage it does to our nation, because it starts with that, and then it, it becomes okay. It starts by you saying in front of your children and to your children that they are somehow better than other people just because they eat different food. The next time it is okay to kill the person next door because they eat different food, well, and they look a little bit different from you. So I actually do think it's a very serious matter. I don't think there's anything to laugh about, and I think it's very sad that the very same negative stereotypes that were created about us and used to justify our, expression, our exclusion from the world community are perpetuated by ourselves. And I think it is criminal that anyone in leadership should ever speak like that about any other people, particularly people from this continent. Okay. We'll take a short break and we'll be back shortly. Welcome back to the cafe in Nairobi. Paul, I wanted to come to you and ask you to tell us whether you really believe the political will really exists. We've, we've heard a few things about New Horizons in Kenya particularly with the new constitution, yeah. but the will has to be there. And it's not, because we're already seeing yeah. tribalism entering preparations for the election next year, and of course the whole International Criminal Court yeah. indictments against certain Kenyan politicians. You're asking whether the political will is there? It is not there across the board. It is there with individuals. But remember, in the grand coalition, I would think that a majority of the individuals in key positions do not have the political will. The good news is the constitution is there. It was passed by the Kenyan people. And when I see what is happening, the encouraging thing is the commitment of the Kenyan people. They are not going to allow their leaders to get away with it in the past, the way they've been doing, however difficult it is. And therefore, uh, what we need in my view, is to continue mobilizing the Kenyan people. The good thing with ICC is that it is the very first time since 1963 that our leaders are being held accountable by an institution they cannot buy, 
or dictator or influence. And this is what is sending panic. And when you look at the statistics, every opinion poll of 80%, 70% have been in support of the ISIS. But why couldn't we, as Kenyans, do it? Why couldn't we do it at home? Right now, what's happening in Kenya, the whole issue of what Atsango said that we've created structures that criminalize people speaking in a certain way is the beginning. Because you see, before, we could not, we could not have picked the people we picked. In fact, we were making fun and said if any judge in Kenya had come up with the names, even if they had done a very good process, if Ocampo used to work here and he took those names to someone in the, in the Kenyan judiciary, they would have called somebody else and said, goodness, I have a file here and I do not know what to do with it. Because if, when you live in Kenya, you see, you, you feel the intricacies, you feel the weight of that decision. You see, sometimes there's a moment that comes that you need to nudge the rock for it to start rolling. That's what ICC has done for us. Why Kenyans could do it before it's very different from whether Kenyans can do it in future. Now Kenyans can do it again. Uh, go ahead, Gifu. Yeah, just in terms of uh, progress, has yeah. Kenya made progress? Mm -hmm. I think Kenya is made up of Kenyans. Mm -hmm. And Kenyans have always made progress. They have always wanted to, to move forward. Coming from the times that uh, Paul is mentioning, the independence struggle, mm -hmm. the people who are there in uh, coming all the way to 92, multipartism, mm -hmm. where Kenyans in their masses came out and said, yeah, we want multipartism. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the other one that we could check out is uh, 2002, you know, where Kenyans once again actually would go and arrest corrupt officers. When an, a, a corrupt police officer tries to bribe the driver of Matatu, Kenyans would come out and arrest the person. But what I want to say is that uh, the leadership has always slowed us down. Because I remember now a government uh, statement or, or, or you know, uh, saying that uh, now that is our job. Don't arrest policemen again. So what I'm trying to say is that Kenyans are always way ahead of their leaders. Yeah. And I think it is time for us to ask our leaders to try and catch up with us. Because we always want to move, we always want to break free from all these... Uh, new leaders who actually can, stay, can move ahead. Exactly. Okay. Let's discuss this new constitution. Is that the answer to healing those ethnic divides? Is that the way forward? Is that what's going to um, bring Kenyans together? For me, I think that is the take-off point. It is a take-off point. This is where you know all our rights are enshrined. We have the Bill of Rights. We have very good things inside this constitution. The thing is, uh, what is the political will to also uh, make sure that this constitution is followed? And Prime Minister, can you tell him what is the political will? Because there yeah, is example, a lot of debate. Yeah, yeah. For example, why, why would we still continue having extrajudicial killings today? You know, and in this uh, government especially, I could say as a fact that uh, there's been more people killed than in any other political regime. So it doesn't make sense how Kenya moves forward and then on the other hand, very terrible things are happening. So what is your question to the PM? My question is, when will people who have been killing our youth be brought to justice? Because without moving on with these kind of things, we can never move forward with the new constitution. Well, you see, uh, Paul made a point here that throughout our history, there have been two forces pulling in two op opposite directions. What I call the process of progression versus the process of retention of the status quo. This is what has defined the political movement in this country. The Constitution is a paper, a document. Now, it needs people of goodwill to implement the Constitution. This is a very critical point in this country today. You would have seen, for example, that there is even uh, resistance in the implementation of the new constitution. The reforms have to be implemented. For example, the police, uh, who are really responsible maybe for the extrajudicial killings, that force must be reformed. Uh, as we are talking right now, there are five bills which are uh, before the cabinet to go to parliament for reform of the police uh, force. PM, let me just yeah. interrupt you there just very briefly. You, you wanted to come in on something? Yeah, it's just, it's just a simple thing because uh, apart from the major reforms and everything about uh, police reforms, the vetting of everything like that, uh, in my village, Muimuto, where I come from, 
if there is a chicken thief who has been arrested, uh, arrested for stealing chicken, they are taken to Kikuyu police station, all right? I'm asking because we have names of police who have shot people and the names are there, they are well known. Yeah. This guy is in the Kwekwe squad and everything. And they continue killing young people up to now. First and foremost is, why is that killing going on? Why are those killings going on? And next, why do we have these names and they have not been arrested? Yeah. There's nothing whatsoever that has happened as pertaining to extrajudicial killings, so which has been reported by the Alston Report, by the Kenya National Commission yeah. on Human Rights, over a thousand youth continue to be disappeared up to now. It's scary. Kim, I have to ask you, I why think, is that? I, I think mean, in fairness to the Prime Minister, mm -hmm. we need to remember we've got this grand coalition government, okay. consisting of some people who would like to punish those who are perpetrating extrajudicial executions. But in that grand coalition government, there are also people holding key positions in power That's right. who are actually the godfathers or the ones doing the execution. What am I saying? This grand coalition government cannot be expected, it doesn't have the capacity, it doesn't have the will to put to a stop the extrajudicial execution because they are the ones doing it. So what does that mean? There's, there's, is, there's no the healing, answer? there's no closing the chapter. What does it mean? First, I think we may, Kenya has made tremendous progress in having this constitution. Mm -hmm. The challenge is in implementation. Which is and key. the creation of credible institutions that are going to bring about the new distribution, more equitable distribution of wealth, for example. Mm -hmm. So that you are not marginalizing anybody. But in order to move forward, we need to isolate those provisions of the constitution that can guarantee us holding free and fair elections. Asango, and let me, Asango, you're directly involved in the constitutional issue, right? I wrote the constitution. I'm not in the, com well, in the limitation commission. Yeah. I am one of the, I was one of the members of the committee of experts. Um, we occluded ourselves deliberately from serving on the commission on the implementation of the constitution. However, I agree with Gunjiri that this is not the responsibility of one or two individuals. The reason why we were able to get the constitution through in the first place, and this was a two decades long journey. I mean, Paul, the prime minister, myself, we've been, I have become old in this process. You know, we, <laughs> I found them there. Yeah. You know, I have gotten old. I have children that I now am seeing. <laughs> who have become adults mm -hmm. whilst I have been doing this. Mm -hmm. So the people who, you know, were probably toddlers when we got started. Mm -hmm. So, you know, frankly, it's not something that happens overnight. Mm -hmm. It is like Githuku said, the grand stone. But what we need to understand is that it gives us the institutional framework that allows us. I don't think, I must say actually, sitting from where I am, I have been pleasantly surprised. There are things that have happened much faster than I thought they would. I'm now not talking about the formal, I'm not, I'm not, not talking about the formal process. That process we know, that's moving slowly, there's problems with that. What I am excited about is that people already begin to understand that they can't get away with many of the things that they used to be able to get away with. For example, when there was the attempt to nominate, to nominate the um, Chief Justice, the Attorney General, the DPP, according to procedures that had nothing to do with the Constitution. Mm -hmm. It is a historical first that the president actually had to step back, Absolutely. that nobody, nobody who was in a position officially to advise the president was willing. So the new Constitution is, is helping yes. to, to, yeah. to oh, heal uh, the divide, and it's happening. Yeah. But let's talk about it's something current steps. and live, the, the International Criminal Court charges against some of your colleagues. Do you think that they should be tried in The Hague? and go to prison if found guilty? Well, you know, I'm nationalistic. I would have been the first person who would have wanted that these people be charged here. How can you say that, PM, when we've just heard There's, from some of our let, let colleagues let, let, here the, the decades and decades no, no, of impunity no, no, let, and the let, failure let, of the judiciary let me just, in just Kenya? Let's just move on. You see, Waki actually recommended the first, because of lack of confidence in the judiciary, that an independent tribunal independent of the judiciary, we set up here to try these people locally. We passed this in the cabinet. We went to parliament. Parliament refuses. Because parliament say that um, if this were to come here, then only the small fish would be fried. The bigger fish cannot be tried locally. Therefore, all of them sang Hague 
until we say, don't be vague, say Hague. So we said then to Hague. We lost the vote in, in Parliament. And the second attempt did not even pass the Cabinet. Uh, thereafter, there was a, a, an attempt by a private member of Parliament, Honorable mm Gitobo -hmm. Manyara, mm -hmm. which was also rejected by Parliament. Mm -hmm. So we said to Hague. Yeah, we we, we, we uh, all know the background, we all know the history, uh, 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 but the question but is, now, do you actually support, at this moment in time, no. some of your colleagues being tried in the International Criminal Court and going to prison if found guilty? You see, what was surprising is that when the names were now announced or made public by Mr. Campo, then the, the, the game changed. Oh, this is an attempt to exclude some popular presidential candidates, then it is all of a sudden the Prime Minister who has handed the names to Mr. Ocampo. Now, then now, everybody now begins to, to raise the flag of nationalism. Kenya is not a failed state. We should not have our people tried in The Hague. These people should be tried here. I said, no. Wait a minute, all of you sang The Hague at that time when you did not know who was, was, who was involved. So I've said this is now something that is sinister. It is actually an attempt to try to defeat the ends of justice. But does that heal our divide, or does that put you ahead in the race for next year's uh, presidential election? You see, you see uh, I have myself have said it's not a question of the elections, and even elections. But that's not true. Only that's not true. Much more it matters that key political opponents are out of the scene, let's say. No, 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 no. That may even be counterproductive, uh, you know, as a matter of fact, because there will be a, a lot of sympathy. Um, I have said that um, the reason why we want to deal with this and deal with this quickly is so that we can slay this animal of imp called impunity, um, but irrespective of the consequences, as, as, in as far as I'm concerned. Let me just say this. What is the option? of not trying these people at the head. The option is actually sending a profound message to the Kenyan people that the warlords are in charge. We, we just, and if we say it that way, then obviously they are going to use their war machinery to ensure that the next elections are held. We cannot afford not to try these people. For my mind speaking for myself, it's a great ship the taxpayers' money is being spent without the consent of the taxpayers because the government has now adopted the cases against these six people. But guys, the what, yeah, yeah. But will it heal our ethnic divides? That's what I really want to, to get at. Kiyama hasn't had a chance. Right, thanks, sir. Uh, I think very quickly on this, I'll start off with just a small point from the last discussion. Other than the constitution, I think the other great thing to happen to Kenya is a grand coalition government. Because all it has shown is that the political class is just a political class. It shape shifts between one side to the other depending on the needs. Now, bring that down to the ICC which sort of takes up the right honorable prime minister's position that at some point you could make the nationalist argument, the sovereign argument and this kind of thing. Some of us got our beef with the ICC, but the argument we make is, is that maybe the ICC is the only point, is the only major focal point of deterrence that we have in the world at the moment, and we might want to use that if it brings on the basis of taking forward the gains we have made. But we have to be also very honest that it, ha it can actually serve the counterproductive bit of coming to divide us on the basis of, if you relate that to the sort of parochial tribal identity and ethnic sort of nationalist definition we are going to give it, it's going to be very bad because we will not say this on your cafe, on the TV show, but this is what we'll spend our time doing back at home mm -hmm. every evening and with our people. So it's always important that we see so that sort so of So maybe then what we need to do as Kenyans is, is, I mean, aside from the new constitution and perhaps the, the International Criminal Court and however it ends will help to foster um, a sense of healing, maybe we need to actually focus more energy on how we build a sense of nationhood, because nobody's no. talked about that. No. Yeah. How do we, is, yeah, that's okay, go for it, made. tell me. That's the first point I made when we started this conversation. Mm. My first point is that we actually do not have a Kenyan identity. And, and a lot of work needs to go into that. We need to form, because <coughs> and a Kenyan identity comes with a Kenyan culture. Yeah. The reason why we have ICC people shape shifting is because, you see, if we had a culture that said you can't go and kill people, for an election. 
it, it, then it wouldn't matter who does it. We wouldn't start having a conversation that so and so is suspected and is my brother, yeah. so it can't be right. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening now. Mm -hmm. Since we never, we don't have a Kenyan culture, mm -hmm. you can't stand here and say we take tea like this mm -hmm. as Kenyans. Yeah. That's a that's a thing. And I think the next leadership in this country. And that's why, and, and, and I know uh, Paul said we, we need to stop shifting responsibility to the leadership. Mm -hmm. But you see, this country is it's a political nation. Well, the leaders are elected by us. Yes. So, yes. We, elect those so we need so to why elect do the we, ones why did, yeah, why did we then keep electing leaders who do <laughs> everything against fostering a sense of... We are electing tribal warlords. Yeah. We are electing tribal, tribal warriors, actually. Is the Prime Minister a, a tribal <laughs> warlord? <laughs> we are electing tribal We've said that there is enough evidence against the Prime Minister. Yeah. Let hey, him go yes. there. Then yeah. If there's evidence yeah. against uh, President Kebaki, yeah. let him go there. Yeah. That's, that's it's not really about the people. Yeah. It's not about the people. Yeah. Okay. This is a message, as, as, as somebody pointed out, if you do not punish anybody for 2007, 2012 will be terrible. Mm -hmm. Because what we are going to have said to young people who saw people slaughtering each other right. in the street is that, you know what, you can do this, get away with it, get into power, and shift Play the, just manipulate the cards and get away with it. We need a situation sent, and it's unfortunate that the way it's come up with the, with the, with the parochial tribal interest in and the play that's happening, mm -hmm. but it has to be done. Mm -hmm. So you asked a question, is this going to heal the country? Mm -hmm. Not in the immediate, no. but in the long term. Mm -hmm. Again with the ICC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 In the long term. I only talked about one experience of exclusion. Mm -hmm. I have experiences out of 2006, I have experiences, you know, it's not about people not liking you. It's about that the person that doesn't like you has the power to do something to you. I was removed from a plane where I was supposed to be representing Kenya because I didn't speak the language, the mother tongue of the, of, of the minister in charge of the ministry, and I had done all the work. And I, he thought that because I speak the mother tongue that I do, or he suspected because actually he had my ethnic identity wrong, he suspected that I speak a particular mother tongue that I do not identify, therefore, with the people who belong to the political clique that he belongs to. Now, there are people who have lost their lives because of this. So for me, the ICC is not about whether or not the people that are implicated in perpetuating those crimes are tried here or somewhere else. For me, it's about justice. And you cannot have healing as long as this country does not acknowledge that something very wrong happened in 2007, that something very sick happened in 1997, that something very sick happened in 1992, that something very sick has been happening in this country for decades. <laughs> the number of people who have just been disappeared, people who have died, I know what it is like to lose somebody and wonder what it is that happened on the night which he died. And know that you cannot rely on a court of justice in your own country to actually do something about it. Sometimes that's all you want to know, and there will be no healing as long as exactly like Gituku was saying, as long as people are just disappearing, as long as people think it is okay to do this to other people, and we don't care what the justification is. So guys, so guys as, as, we, as we look ahead, 2012 is on the horizon. Um, there are efforts to try and get the new constitution in place in time. The ICC issue still looms. Is Kenya going to move forward or move backwards? Yeah, we, should we expect more violence and chaos or, or not? I think Kenya is a, is a country that uh, always w strives to move forward. You can only uh, look at our athletes, for example, Rudisha and the rest of them. We don't even know all of them uh, offhand because there are so many and they do us proud. I think that is how I compare the whole of Kenya. As we always want to move forward. We always want to make sure that things uh, move ahead, but progress. But sometimes Kenya is not in our hands to, but, to do it. But even without talking about the ICC, because that's already going on, we don't even need to discuss that. That should continue going on. The issue of justice must, must uh, be seen to be done. Because how can we go to elections when we have IDPs number four, you know, which is what we are discussing now, all right? And these, as I said earlier, are just the new kids on the block. We have the 92 and the earlier, who are not even called IDPs then, but squatters, all right? So how can we expect to have a free and fair election when we have IDPs in tents up to now? So as long as we are not willing, and the politi political class is not willing to uh, address the issues of internally displaced people in this country, then definitely we are still going to have chaos in this country. PM 2012, where are we headed? Well, you know, uh, Yvonne, uh, 
the good thing in these countries is that a very large percentage of our population is young. Actually, you know, 72 percent of our population is below 35 years of age. To me, I see that as a very big, big asset for us. Most of this young population is detribalized. But a number of these people don't think along the three lines. The ones who are incorrigibly uh, 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 de deranged uh, with the ethnic ideology are just a very small percentage of the population. So I think that um, 2012 is going to present a very big opportunity for our country. I say that this is the Kenyan moment. And I think that uh, this youth will liberate this country. Because um, until and unless that Kenyan, that the founding nation, fathers of our nation uh, envisioned come, we will not be able to realize the Kenyan dream, which says, justice be our shield and defender. May we dwell in unity, peace and liberty, and plenty be found within our borders. I believe that the Kenyan dream is actually realizable. Well, we have to leave it there, Prime Minister. Thanks for joining us on the cafe. Next week, we'll be discussing the problem of corruption in Kenya. People were forthcoming. I did not get the feeling that people were saying what needs to be said. People were saying what they feel and what they believe in. I really think that the only thing we have is our country. And I don't think we can afford to take things for granted. And I think if we don't sort out what has happened, and if we don't find a peaceful way to resolve it, then our country will explode. And that just means the loss of all of us. Beyond the cafe, uh, also you know, in our shopping centers, in our, in our churches, in the mosques, I think this is something that should continue going on. Because traditionally, that's how we've been dialoguing in Africa. Go under a tree if there's a dispute, as a particular tree for a particular community, and then solve the dispute there. Uh, the very interesting bit was the, when we started speaking about the identity of the Kenyan nation and sort of trying to draw all the different issues we had discussed earlier on the basis of does it define us within a particular identity or it doesn't. We wish we could do this a lot more often. We actually have senior members of government sitting with uh, average members of society in a cafeteria having a conversation about stuff that is important to us. It was really good having him sit and it's also kudos to him for actually sitting through the show. Yeah, it is um, something different. Uh, used to being invited to the studio uh, and, and then uh, being interviewed solo. Um, this was a debate uh, which is very different. I think this is a very exciting experience.